Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lokes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. In this video lesson, we're going to wrap up our discussion of numerical computation techniques for finding roots of equations. So far, we've been considering a variety of different methods for finding roots of equations. The first one that we discussed was the graphical technique. Now generally we don't use the graphical technique to actually get the answer, but we use a graphical technique to get general location of where the answer should be. Or to see if our function, you know, maybe is periodic or is going to have multiple roots, etc. So graphical techniques are very helpful. They usually are a first step and not a final step. The next method we discussed was the method of bisection. This is a really simple trap the answer logic. We just simply find values of x that go from positive to negative on the function, and so 0 has to be in between. And we keep chopping the interval in half until we get the point located as well as we feel necessary. Now on this, you're going to have to have two points. An improvement on this was the regular falsi method. This also requires two points, but it's going to improve upon the bisection method because it's going to do a smarter way of choosing the point in the interval. So we're going to fit a straight line between the two endpoints, and where the line crosses the axis is probably closer than just simply going with the midpoint. Our next technique was the Newton-Raphson technique. And in the Newton-Raphson technique, we took a first order Taylor series and found that using that, I could use only one point for my function in order to approximate the others. However, I needed to be able to evaluate the derivative of the function. So if I couldn't take the derivative, Maybe it was just one of those functions where it's just really complicated and I was unable to. This method is not going to work in those cases, but it's nice because it only requires one point. And if you can take the derivative, it converges very rapidly. For those times when we couldn't take a derivative, a variation on newton raphson that we looked at was the secant method. And the secant method uses a approximation to the first derivative and therefore it's going to require two points because we're going to have to do a delta y over delta x and so I'm going to need to know two points and I'll constantly be replacing one so I'm not going to have to make decisions about positive and negative like I did with bisection I'll always replace the older of my two guesses but it is going to be, you know, requiring two first guesses. And our final solution method that we looked at was successive substitution. Now, su successive substitution is an algebra-based method. Unfortunately, it can be unreliable. But if you have a little bit of algebra talent, you can try a different algebra variation on your function and maybe get it to work. So it's easy, it only requires one point, but it doesn't always work and it may be very slow. Regardless of which method you choose, we are going to be using relative error limits to determine when to stop your loop. Now let's look at a few programming tips. All of these methods require at least one first guess, maybe two first guesses. I'm going to tell you that a good guess makes all the difference. You should try this on your own. Take some of the answers where we you know, started with something and you got it to converge and it all seemed great. Try putting in different values, okay? Go into it blind without knowing what the first guess is. And some of those are just going to be a disaster at that point. Now how do you make that first guess? Well, I've got two different ways that 
are reasonable. And one is if you know anything physical about the system, use that to help you guide you in a rational choice. Maybe you're doing something where you are looking for the compressibility factor and you know it's going to be a gas, then Z equal to 1 is a good first choice. Or if it's a liquid, using Z equal to 0 or something very close to 0 would be a reasonable choice. But for other cases, I may not have any idea of what the answer ought to be. In general, I recommend doing kind of a quick variation on the graphing technique where you're going to evaluate the function at several points or create a really quick graph of the function before you get started simply so that you have an idea of where to start looking. Now, another thing is that these all required iterative techniques. And because our computer programs can get locked up in one of those if we did something not very clever, maybe we were using I as our counter, and every time somewhere in my loop I accidentally subtracted one. Well, every time it counts up, it just gets shot right back down, and I end up never getting to leave my loop. So if this happens to you and your program just seems to run and run forever, try control break first. You might have some luck with escape, try it, and if everything else fails, use the control alt delete. Next, if you're writing a program that you are planning to use again in the future, be sure that it really does what you had in mind. Especially, you will one day have a job and you will want to do these calculations for your job and you're probably going to want to keep the program around. So, basically have the computation print or display the first few terms and compare them to whatever your hand calculated values were. Okay, now this does mean you had to do hand calculated values. And yes, sometimes I do those hand calculated values in Excel. But be sure that you're doing that and checking to make sure what the program is doing. The second thing if you're planning to use this for the future is add lots of comments. These are for you. They are not for anyone else. They're not for me grading it, etc. They are for you. You will be able to go back in and edit your program much more easily, borrow from it where you need to. You will have an easier time if you add lots of comments at appropriate places. Describe what this little loop is going to be doing describe why you're calling this other function, etc. And then my third thing on writing programs for the future is name them in a way that is meaningful. So often I see people save things as homework one. Okay, well that's awesome because when you're turning it into me, it might have been homework one. But if you want to use this for the future, naming it something like cubic equation of state by regular falsy is more meaningful because then later when you're in a course where you need to solve a cubic equation of state, you have a program that you know will do that. And it will require li very little editing from you if you were able to identify it quickly. And then one last topic that we really haven't addressed directly. And this is about those times when your function has more than one root. For instance, since with thermodynamics we solve so many cubic equations and we know that those have three roots and one of those will be real and the other two might be real but they might also be complex and usually we just miss those. In that case, once you have one of the roots, you actually can algebraically reduce the equation to a quadratic using polynomial division. And if you do that, then you could use the quadratic formula to find out what the other answers are analytically. But in fact, there are analytical formulas for finding the roots of cubic polynomials. And so you might wish to look those up. Some of our functions that we're going to run into will be periodic in nature. Okay. Uh, in one of our assignments, I've given you something that has something called a Bessel function. And Bessel functions are periodic. 
Generally on these, there's going to be a constrained set of x values that are physically meaningful. So although x could be anything from negative infinity to infinity as far as the function is concerned, for your program maybe it is limited to being between 0 and 1, for instance. If this is the case, add limits to your computer program that will reflect this, okay? And that will help keep you from chasing non-physical answers. And then finally, we are going to sometimes have functions that have repeated roots, triple roots, double roots, etc. When you have a root that's repeated or it has multiplicity, What's going to happen is you're going to have both the function and one or more of its derivatives equal to zero at that point. These are going to cause program problems almost always. And so these are going to be a real challenge to us. Fortunately, they don't occur all that much in nature, but they do occur. And so if you are having problems, again, go to the graph and look at the graph and see if possibly it has repeated roots. So this concludes our little wrap-up of numerical computation uh, for finding roots. And next, we will be starting to look at numerical calculus techniques. Thank you very much for your time.